first and just in case details could be that this is the same to return the reference Look like uh, uh, we kept exactly the same architecture. Yeah, it's just and front end. It's still it's a very small language, and uh, just small language. Really, this one and this. It was called uh, separate and I proceed the code. We have three languages, but types of production. Fast one and make sure the best of to and also that is external from one in a core and one I craft for sharp for open source and workshop and so had to produce uh, but still is not fast and so they, because they wanted to emit this intermediate uh, step, which is still is come back to that later. But version was still sub uh, now And all of them here, but there was in that version, also AI framework. And the reason why that is, it's uh, by abduction, I had quite a memory, but it's too And it would break. The full power. And so it looks like manipulation on top like this. So on the front hand side we have the more languages, Erlang and Hack. And based on a new immediate textual which I and we still have So we have seeing this uh, prototype, really functional development. Shaker, uh, 
uh, we had nine and we three of them and by default we have fifty types enabled. So so about in which A new language and analysis of but basically the ones who are provided rights and check. But shared for um, that day, so still very simple for construction some state basically go to between those. Because it's you have a lot of work now. Basically, it's a compiler. And much of you still have a compiler, but some there's a lot of in There's some things there are no that have. Start to uh, to work backwards from this. Uh, but I did for front end. Silver is not so. Is that? And so when we uh, create, uh, we call tech. Even act, uh, but so correctly, for instance, for the place, there's an from her and to work with. From uh, here then. Uh, two ways from intermediate for the front Where 
uh, bring them into fact. You have to know the types everywhere. Uh, so where it would be types in any pieces here, we'll infer them for. Okay. <laughs> to, uh, uh, and everything is now framework. And it's a great platform. Uh, a component with here, which and the piece that lets you. Infer to work about it. And that is it to new result analysis on bar. Somewhere and return it to, uh, to another. Uh, so in exchange, you get mechanism three. What is analyzed at most once. This means summary has to cover all possible or are they partial? Or be uh, possible and good enough to cover sets. We don't want to re produce yeah. if you general summary that might arrive more expensive. Um, yeah, that's true as well. Uh, okay, you, but have you, you have to be very general and uh, and express everything in terms of your inputs, and uh, that might be overkill in some cases, but that's hard to hard to know. Hi, uh, sorry, oh, I got yeah. another question. So, uh, what happens if uh, there is like a first class function calls like this function point? I don't know which function it is. So, what do we do here? Um, if there's a function pointer, yeah, then I don't know which function it is really. Yeah, so, so like I was saying, <coughs> uh, so um, so if you take a function pointer as argument, then when you call that function, infer doesn't know what it is, so it doesn't know. <coughs> it can't get the summary. Uh, sorry. Uh, for that function, so in that case, what we'll do, we'll still compute a summary just treating the function pointer as an unknown function, and sometimes that's good enough. But we also, if at some other point, uh, you have a caller of that function that uh, passes in a, f a specific function pointer, we know the function, we can go and reanalyze the original function uh, by saying, hey, by the way, this guy is this function, and so then when we reanalyze the function, at the point where the function pointer is called, we know who we're calling, so we can pretend uh, uh, that's that's what gets called. Ah, okay, I see. Thank you. And we compute a new summary we call specialized, 
and so it's specialized to that <coughs> particular value for the function pointer. A <coughs> How about recursive function? How about recursive functions? Uh, so right now, uh, it's very simple-minded. Uh, when we hit a, a recursive call, the analysis, the this engine will return an empty summary and say, "Oh, I don't know this function." Uh, to prevent uh <coughs> uh, loops, but uh, it's not a fundamental limitation. It's just <coughs> there aren't that many recursive functions in the code bases we analyze. But you could imagine at least unrolling this a few times and even computing uh, an invariant, repeating until you, you reach a fixed point. So when you call it an on-demand analysis, does this mean that uh, it's uh, only computing information on, on demand or is this still a whole program analysis? Um, so from this picture, it looks like uh, you start from like a main functions and then analyze everything reachable from there? Ah, uh, no, that is not what we do. Uh, <coughs> yeah, so I was going a bit fast. But uh, so usually we proceed more bottom up. Uh, it's on demand <coughs> in the sense that if you're only interested in something reachable from main or something, you can start at main and it will draw the call graph for you. And we use that property to do in, in at meta, uh, one of the main uses of infer is analyzing code changes, and so we use that very heavily to analyze code changes because we start from only the code that has changed. Uh, and uh, that, that allows us to analyze just a fraction of the code. But <coughs> you can, it's, so it's on demand in the sense you only analyze what you need, uh, but also you can start anywhere in your program and the on-demand analysis will compute what's needed for that. Uh, and we use that both to analyze only a fraction of the code or even when you analyze the whole code base. Uh, we, don't hear we can't know in advance what uh, gets called because the it's not that information is not entirely in the static call graph. <coughs> For instance, when you have function pointers or dynamic dispatch or other things. And so on demand allows us to be flexible here and, and still go and compute summaries when they're needed. And then one more question. So it, it sounds like you are assuming that a call graph is given uh, in advance, or are you computing that on the fly? Off? No, no. Uh, that's why I, I was trying to say uh, we don't we don't have to assume that because the analysis uh, <coughs> this has the ability to go fetch function summaries at any point. So even if you don't know the call graph. But how do you know which functions are being called? Then if if you have again well your analysis will be looking at the at the code, right? And when it sees a function call, it's it says, oh, I need the summary for that function call. Okay, so if you start in a function uh, foo that uh, calls some function that you don't know until you know how foo is being called. So does it then like uh, go backwards and see where foo is being used? Or no, no, we don't go backwards. <coughs> so I think that you're asking the function pointer question Again. For example, yeah. yeah. So if especially now that you have, I uh, see more uh, dynamic languages like Python on the list, where you have a lot of very dynamic yeah, yeah. behaviors. Dynamic so in calls. Hack, we do we do that a lot. We like uh, uh, so you have to when we see when we analyze a function, we do the best we can with the information we have. But if at a later point we know ah actually I know the uh, type of this object is uh, as a concrete type now and it's this. You can go and reanalyze callies in, in those cases if you need to. <coughs> okay, so um, next uh, I want to talk about the AI framework. Oh, that's a bit thin, sorry. Uh, we need, yeah. um, so just like the on-demand analysis gives you <coughs> an inter-procedural scheduler for free, the AI framework so that does the same thing for intra-procedural. So <coughs> when we have source code, uh, we translate it to cell, which is becomes this big CFG. And here I cheated, I didn't write actual cell in the nodes, it's still the C code more or less, <coughs> because it gets a bit too gory. But uh, so now if you were to start from this, you'd have to do a whole bunch of logic to analyze uh, CFGs, but the AI framework does that for you. So what you need to provide for this is uh, 
just a few ingredients. So first of all, you have to describe what your abstract domain is, so, so we know what uh, we're computing. And so in particular, you give it uh, the empty element of your domain, and then AI framework will start the analysis at the start node with the empty state. And then the main uh, piece after that are transfer functions, so how each instruction in SIL affects the uh, abstract state. Uh, basically, basically uh, symbolically executing uh, an instruction on an abstract state <coughs> gives you another abstract state. And, uh, and AI framework will, also will use this transfer function to propagate the state from node to node. So uh, we'll explore the graph uh, this way. Um, and then at uh, join points, we need to do uh, something else because now we have an abstract state coming from each edge. And so uh, <coughs> that's where we call a join function you provided for your domain, borrowing from abstract interpretation uh, lingo. And finally, at uh, loop heads, we'll call your widening function with the number of loop iteration done so far. So if you give all that, uh, then in exchange, you get uh, an interprocedural analysis. And here, I, the I made it go forwards, more or less, but you can uh, customize this, can be forwards or backwards. You can uh, analyze nodes in some uh, given, in some specific, more specific orders, uh, especially around loops. Uh, and I said interprocedural, uh, because here, we also using the on-demand uh, aspect. So when we are analyzing that first node here, uh, we have to make an uh, on-demand call to get the summary for this new node function. And on-demand will uh, give you back a summary. A summary is something you define yourself as well. Uh, and in fact, you have to create those summaries when you analyze functions. <coughs> and a summary can just be the, the state of your analysis at the exit node, or it can be anything you want from, from the result of the whole analysis. So if we shake all of that together, we get an interprocedural analysis with just this few from just these few ingredients. And you didn't have to worry about how to explore the CFG or how to uh, explore the call graph. Yes. Uh, Mike, please. <laughs> Hi. Um, so what is T uh, in the summarize function? Uh, T is the... Um, is your domain, is your abstract domain. Uh, in fact, I is like- Is it a domain or a fact from the domain? It's, uh, it's the domain, it's the, <coughs> oops. So, uh, so it's the type of your abstract states. So it's like an abstract state. Indeed, yes. Okay, yeah, I think this relates to my previous question because here on the, on the next slide, this seems to me like the summary database is indexed by the input fact that you reached the function with, right? Like otherwise, why would you have to pass a T to the summarize function? Uh, is the function you're analyzing, right? And you start from empty uh, <coughs> when you start analyzing your function, so you don't know anything about your inputs. Okay, then what is the T that you're passing to the summarize function? And uh, actually, I lied, it's not quite the T, it's this whole invariant map of the abstract state at all the program points in your CFG that you pass. But usually you take the one at the post. Uh, so this- Oh, a I see, I lot see. of analysis, see. for instance, in post, which computes pre and post for your function uh, in a forward manner. The state you get at the exit node is pretty much the summary. It's the inferred precondition for the whole function uh, all the way to the post. Okay, so the T is, th okay, I think I get it now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's uh, just, yeah, technically, uh, a lot of the time T is just, the, uh, summar the summary type is just the domain type, but uh, that's not true of all analysis, so. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So when you run into a loop where you always iterate to get to some fixed point or you will do some balance between the precision or the time cost here? So the AI framework will iterate until it reaches a fixed point. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it stops after 10,000 iterations or something. <laughs> <laughs> after we had a few infinite loops <laughs> accidentally. 
but uh, but you can use that to do whatever you want. Nothing in the in this framework checks you're actually building an over approximating abstract interpreter. So <coughs> so all these functions you have to give can do arbitrary things. But uh, yeah, so uh, so it reaches a fixed point uh, in Pulse, which is under approximate. We use that to we can emulate uh, fixed unrollings with this by uh, just pretending we've converted after a few iterations by returning the same abstract state again. Okay, I see. Thanks. Um, you said that these always start in the empty state for your domain. Is there anything that you do for the function arguments or do they just become top more or less? Well, your empty state can look at the function arguments. Ah, okay, so it's an empty state per function basically. Yeah, you, cr you get to create the empty state <coughs> from the function you're analyzing. Yeah, all right. Cool. It was Thanks. a simplification, you're right. All right. Um, um, so the final piece I wanted to talk about is Pulse. <coughs> and Pulse is sort of a platform itself as well. Uh, this is where we write a, a, a lot of our new analysis, a lot of our new bug types are on top of Pulse. And uh, you want to use Pulse when pass sensitivity matters and uh, you want to care, you care about uh, infeasible paths and, and things like this and you don't want to, to report on them. Uh, it has a built-in memory and value analysis engine that's uh, very precise. Uh, it was co-developed with incorrectness separation logic. So you can read all about it in a few papers. Uh, and <coughs> from the get-go, it, sort of it was built as a bug finder, not as a proof a prover that your program has no bug, because that's how we use infer. We use it as a bug finder. But it was also uh, built as a sort of extensible engine, so that it would be easy to work with for for our team and others. So I just want to give a brief overview of uh, what's in Pulse, how it works. <coughs> well, maybe not how it works, but <laughs> uh, let's see. So uh, the I just want to describe basically the abstract state of Pulse and then maybe we can all infer how it could maybe work. Uh, so the, the Pulse uh, abstract states represent the, the state of the machine. Uh, so it has a store which uh, assign abstract values to program variables uh, and the intermediate variables that SIL produces which shouldn't be called logical variables now I think about it. Uh, and uh, memory, so this is the only part that mentions program variables, which are mutable. Uh, but then everything is in terms of these abstract values, which have an immutable semantics as the program executes. So when you assign to a program variable, you will make up a new fresh abstract value to represent that. Uh, but the old value will it had will keep its value. And so the memory <coughs> uh, tells you what values point to other values, either via field accesses or the reference. And then there's this sort of mysterious extra map of attributes, which is a bit of metadata telling you <coughs> uh, facts about your values, such as, oh, this value is invalid because we called pre on it, or this value must be valid because we dereferenced it or it's been allocated, so it should be freed at some point, <coughs> etc. So for instance, <coughs> assigning null to uh, something in memory, our state would look maybe like this just before. Uh, we know that L is some abstract value VL. And in memory, we know that VL <coughs> has a next field that points to some value V. When we assign to it, uh, in the post state, it points to some new value, v0. We know v0 equals 0, uh, and th we know that it's invalid uh, because it's the null pointer. Okay? So, what we work, uh, what Pulse works with is not one of these states, but at any time a pair of these states, uh, one that represents the inferred precondition for the function uh, so far, and one that represents the current state. And there's a formula as well, like v0 equals 0 on the previous slide was actually not part of this base domain. 
There is something that's shared between the pre and the post, <coughs> thanks to the fact that values are immutable. And that's sort of all the pure facts about values, like equalities and inequalities. So coming back to this, uh, we would start in an empty state, which is pretty close to empty, uh, amp amp. And then when we analyze uh, LR on X gets null, we'll make a few inferences about the precondition and the postcondition. So we'll say, ah, so L had to be allocated from the beginning. So, and now I changed the precondition to this. And also because I dereferenced de VL, I know it must have been valid, uh, a valid pointer. And I make a note of that in the precondition. And in the postcondition, it, it points to a new value that happens to be equal to zero and is invalid. And uh, <coughs> this, in this interplay between valid, uh, must be valid and invalid is very important in Pulse. That's how it tracks uh, null pointer dereference and the like. It's when these two meet. So to in order for Pulse to report something here, it has to have strong evidence that something wrong happened. So it must know that something became invalid. It saw the assignment to something wrong, something invalid, like the null pointer, and then it, uh, that you trying to dereference it as well. Yes? Uh, if you're going to get to this later, by the way, that's, that's totally fine. I was wondering if you have multiple parameters of pointer type, uh, what kind of assumptions you make about aliasing uh, or whether you actually figure those out based on your analysis of the body, like the same kind of thing, where if you see equality checks, you might right, so put that in the precondition? <coughs> uh, yeah, equalities are part of our language of formulas here. So when things are aliased in, in within the function, no problem, we will be in the abstract state. But if we don't know anything else, <coughs> by default, we make the assumption that things are separate. So this is still separation logic at the heart, and uh, unless we unless we know otherwise, uh, things are all separate in memory. And uh, if we discover that this is not the case, for instance, at a call site, there's some aliasing that wasn't computed in the summary. We we use our uh, cheat code again and go and reanalyze the uh, the callee with the fact that a and start with this aliases. Um, can you go back one slide? I think so. Uh, maybe one more. You had a slide where the code was, and then you had two empties in it. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so does that mean you start from the middle, and then you like go back and forwards? With no, no, know, that's the start of the empties? function. <laughs> oh, yeah, but, but like wha wha why do we have two empties? Aha, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, one is the precondition, and one is oh, the okay. current postcondition. Okay, I get it. Okay, thanks. Will you tell us what is a join in this domain? Kind of. Uh, okay. <coughs> uh, yes, this is coming. So we're not done building the Pulse abstract domain yet. But uh, first, I wanted to ju say a few words about the formula, although I don't really have time. <coughs> but basically, uh, there's a little SMT solver inside of Pulse that can do reasoning on arithmet linear arithmetic, equalities and inequalities. Uh, it uh, pretends everything is uh, rational, uh, so uh <coughs> it's not very good at integer or bit vector reasoning or uh, disjunctions uh, as well, because it doesn't really do a lot of set solving. Uh, but for programs, uh, that's often enough. <coughs> and so, uh in the interest of time, uh, I go fast here, but uh, why is it important to have an SMT solver inside of Pulse? Well, <coughs> when you have a, a, pro a realistic program, you have lots of patterns like this. This can be right in the code, or this can be because of interprocedural analysis, and these live far away from each other. So in this, uh, in this case, in one ca if x is greater than y, we assign p to null. And so when we come back from the if, we get two, bra two states, and this is where the join of pulse comes into play. So here we've applied a join, and the join is just accumulating states. 
uh, and I say more in just a second. And so it's important to know which, ca which case corresponds to which conditions because when you see code like this afterwards, the SMT solver has to tell you that you cannot be into the branch where P is null because that would be a contradiction. And so you know it's safe to dereference P here, I think. Uh, okay, uh, so now we're ready for p the pulse domain. Uh, it's a path splitting domain, so it's actually a list of those states. And um, there's a hard limit on the number of distance we accumulate. Uh, and together with finite loop and rolling, this, is, this gives us an under approximating analysis. So it only covers some behaviors of the program, but the ones it covers, we're sure, are true behaviors. And so summing up, the domain is a list of pre's and posts and a formula, and each pre and post has some uh, model of the memory. And this is actually also a simplification, but uh, by and large, this looks like this. All right. Uh, last thing I wanted to mention is how to manipulate pulse states. So this is a model of a C++ swap function, which swaps two pointers. <coughs> and this is the old way we would write this. So it already had some facilities to to uh, let you write this somewhat easily. So you, you can see it's reading two fields and then writing two fields, but you have to write some boilerplate. There's some very mysterious symbols uh, along the way. Um, and you, you carry this abstract state around, which is the objective domain. Uh, but still, Pulse does a lot of work for you because you're just saying, I'm reading and writing uh, in the memory and behind the scene, Pulse will abduce what it needs to the precondition uh, and check that pointers are valid and do all sorts of things. Uh, but now we have a nice DSL, uh, we call it, uh, which is just a monad uh, for writing, for manipulating pulse states. So now the state has kind of disappeared into the monad and the code is uh, nicer to read, hopefully, and nicer to write. Okay, so that's all I had. Um <coughs> uh, Infer is a platform in uh, more ways than one. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's all platform. So we have platforms for adding languages, the on-demand analysis. You can build directly onto on-demand uh, if you uh, don't want to use the AI framework. Uh, otherwise, you can cast your analysis into AI somewhat. Even uh, use that if you want a precise model of the memory and values uh, and all that good stuff, uh, you can build directly inside of Pulse, and we try to make that easy as well. And uh, just some things that are top of mind for us at the moment, uh, which may or may not materialize. Uh, this is not contractually <laughs> binding. <laughs> uh, <coughs> so we're thinking about adding new languages. Now we have this uh, nifty textual interface that makes it a bit easier. Um, so Python, uh, is a is an important language at Meta, uh, as is Swift, which has kind of replaced Objective C in a lot of use cases. We are thinking about uh, going beyond under approximation to get better coverage of programs uh, in Pulse. Um, it would be really cool if Infer could suggest fixes for the bug it reports, so that developers uh, had a, a little help there. And finally, uh, OCaml five uh, is a thing now. It's multicore. Infer, I didn't talk about this, but it's very, very parallel. Uh, the, and the analysis scheduler actually schedules the analysis in parallel over multiple processes, but uh <coughs> they have to share their results via an external database, and it would be really nice if they could just use the m shared memory instead and threads. So we think there would be a lot of, uh, of value in moving to multicore here. So yeah, I stop here. Thanks. Um, so you mentioned adding over approximation. Is the goal there to, after you've um, sort of found a bunch of bugs and fixed them, to s then prove that you don't have any bugs anymore? Is that like a verification goal, or what are you doing with the over approximation? Uh, it is not a verification goal <coughs> uh, because I don't think we can achieve verification with uh, 
for two reasons. One is infer is a fully automatic tool, so uh, it will have to be somewhat inferable by infer that your program is correct, which even for correct programs would be very hard. Second of all, I don't think there are any correct programs in the stuff we analyze, so uh <laughs> we I don't think it's something we can uh achieve. Um so so what is the goal of All right, so the goal the I mean the goal would be to so when we analyze a program, we throw a lot of states away uh, and we don't know what was in those states. So it would be knowing what was in those states, even a coarse approximation of it would give us some idea of if we missed something important or not. And uh, in my dreams, I, I have this idea that uh, you could start with an over approximating analysis. And then when it finds a problem, but it's not sure because it's over approximating, it can go and and replay with an under approximating analysis to see if there, there is an actual problem. Uh, and uh, or we can do something a bit in between like by abduction was doing uh <coughs> before which is trying to join states as much as possible when it doesn't look lose too much precision and then uh, uh, yeah, work with that. Thanks. So these are a few possibilities. Yeah, um, seems very cool. Uh, does Pulsar infer in general work when you don't have all the code for a program? Uh, I'm thinking, well, I'm not sure how the Java front end works, but like in open source, you'll have some source code and then you'll have tons of third party libraries as jars. And I don't know if you have a bytecode front end or how that would work. Yeah, we do have a bytecode front end. <coughs> Oh, okay, but so in principle, like, would you recommend translating everything to SIL and doing analysis over that whole program, or? No, <laughs> I wouldn't, I mean, I would normally no, because it, it's a bit, it's expensive, and so you, you will always have unknown code, even if you analyze all the bytecode, for you will have native functions, you will have some built-ins, um, so it's unavoidable, and so the infer analysis, the way they're built, they're, they're pretty, they, they degrade gracefully uh, in the face of unknown code, so it's not too much of a big deal, uh, usually. So yeah, uh, each analysis will have its own heuristics uh, in the face of unknown code of, oh, let's scramble the memory here because it looks like uh, your this could modify this object, or yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's not perfect, but it, uh, it allows us to get past it. Yeah, so can we consider the seal layer is kind of stable now? Because you want to support a lot different language, front end languages, but they are quite different. Uh, so will it like need necessary to be changed a little or be extended a little bit when you're trying to support new language that has mm. like its own different high level semantics information that you want to catch? Um. <coughs> Well, uh, there are two several ways to interpret stable, but uh, I mean, at the binary level, it's not super stable because every so often we change some data structures. But at the high level, it's been stable for many, many years now. Uh, it's still the same four or five instructions. Uh, sorry. And when we add new languages and we need something uh, still can't provide, usually we just encode that as some function call uh, to a built-in and then analysis backends that actually care about precise semantics of things have to know how to interpret that built-in. Okay, thank you. So that's a convenient escape hatch we use often. So I'm a little uncertain about the structure of these different components. Um, so is uh, Pulse still building on top of the abstract interpretation framework? Yes. Like As this diagram makes clear, <laughs> uh, yeah, the but it, it doesn't <laughs> seem like uh, abstract interpretation style. It doesn't seem to fit into that uh, abstract interpretation. Uh, yes, uh, structure you described. Well, that go yes. So the AI framework is called abstract interpretation framework, but really is uh, just a functor. You give it a domain with some functions for join and widen, <coughs> and uh, a transfer function, and then it builds a an intra-procedural scheduler. So it's really an intra-procedural analysis uh, framework. And it uses, because it uses vocabulary from uh, abstract interpretation, 
it's useful to think of it in those terms you, uh, often, but you write for Pulse, it, uh, it, E3 is stretching it, <laughs> but uh, I mean, but still, when you come back from an if, you have an operation you have to do, uh, we call it join, and yeah. Okay, and then for example, this finite loop on rolling you mentioned, that's also uh, encoded in. Yeah, in it's encoded as uh, something that converges in a, in a abstract interpretation kind of way, but really what it does is uh <coughs> using the number of loop iterations, when it's bigger than the threshold, it will return the previous state and pretend. Uh, and then the air framework will say, ah, well, that implies the previous state I had, so you've converged, so congrats. Okay, so it's in, in a sense an unsound widening function. Yeah, well, you can give it an unsound widening yeah. function. It won't, there's no... Okay. And then all this still builds on top of this uh, on-demand analysis for intra-procedural. Yes, okay. correct. Makes sense. Thanks. Yep. One more. Un unless someone else has a question. Uh, yeah, I was curious uh, how Pulse uh, handles virtual calls or higher order functions. Is that some logic built into Pulse or is that something language specific that happens somewhere else? <coughs> so, uh, there's some language specific <coughs> uh, bits. Um, so, infer there's SIL, one part of SIL that uh, I didn't show. So, SIL is the CFGs of instructions, but there's also this type environment we have on the side, which where you have your class hierarchy uh, typically. And Pulse can query that to, to resolve. Uh, method calls. <coughs> so that's one part. And the other part is this specialization technique I mentioned, where when Pulse goes to a method call and it realizes it doesn't really have enough information to fully resolve it, and it's still abstract, uh, it will make a note of it. And then if a, callee, a caller uh, ever calls this function and has a concrete type for that object, it will reanalyze that callee with that extra information. And now, in the when we reanalyze this, we can uh, fully resolve the call and produce a more accurate summary for that case. Yeah, uh, the, the, the reason I asked is because if you naively consult the class hierarchy, that might go against your uh, goal of having no false positives, right? Yeah. So yeah. that's why I was asking specifically about Pulse, if it only analyzes virtual call targets that it can actually prove are feasible. Uh, no, yeah, we don't have a mode like this. I mean, it would be easy to add, but not very valuable because it would stop a lot. And it would stop at unknown calls as well, right? The only sound thing to do when you have an unknown call is return bottom. And same with a virtual call you couldn't resolve. And so that would cut down the analysis in a lot of useful cases. So then you might get false positives in the presence of virtual calls. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And unknown functions and weaknesses in the SMT solver and okay, so so no false positives is like end. a sort of top level aspiration, but there are various corner cases where you still get false positives from false. I mean, like like all soundness theorems, it has a precondition that says, uh, assuming the semantics is like this, then uh, no false positives. Yes. Okay. I know that in Furris and sound, can you have tunable soundness, uh, or do you have tunable soundness? In in uh, what way? Uh, like like, uh, like you you push a button and can you have sound analysis? Um, well, yeah, that's kind of uh, related to that, right? Uh, <coughs> well, if you don't if you don't have any unknown calls, uh, uh, then. Uh, Pulse is sound for bug catching, and if you don't filter anything, by abduction is sound for verification. So, uh, but we don't really have switches to stop in case there's something we go beyond those hypotheses. Okay, I think we'll stop here. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks for all the questions.